Review time is the home for all things theme parks. Stay up to date with our videos by subscribing and tapping the bell icon. When Disneyland opened in July of 1955, it changed the path of themed entertainment forever. And one park that learnt from the great teachings of Disney was New York's Freedom Land USA, largely in part due to this Disneyland of the East being created by C.V. Wood, Disneyland's first official cast member and the first to be fired by Walt himself. Freedom Land USA was an American historical theme park where guests could experience old Chicago as it burned to the ground, dodge cannon fire during a wagon ride through a Civil War battlefield, and even experience a simulation of an earthquake that killed over 3,000 people. Freedom Land was billed as the world's largest entertainment center, bigger and better than Disneyland. But the park's great popularity and ambition couldn't save it from its fatal flaw. The park was designed to fail, as part of an elaborate real estate ruse. For review time, I'm Luke, and this is the story of Freedom Land USA, the failed Disneyland of the East. But in order to understand the park and why it was built, we need to understand a little more about C.V. Wood. Cornelius Vanderbilt Wood was an American developer and the first official employee of Disneyland. Walt and Roy Disney hired Wood to be the vice president and general manager of the Disneyland project, and was the man responsible for choosing the site in Anaheim. However, around a year after Disneyland had opened, the relationship between Disney's and the man Walt had once publicly said he considered as a son had soured, and C.V. Wood was fired by Walt Disney himself who felt betrayed by Wood's eagerness to take credit for the immediate success of Disneyland. Whilst the exact truth of what happened and why may never be truly known with varying rumors flying around from embezzlement to UFO beliefs, what we do know though is Wood went his separate way and started Marco Engineering, a consulting firm for the leisure industry, where a number of Disneyland's designers and engineers would join him including the architect who designed Main Street USA, who would go on to create a very similar street at Freedom Land. On the 25th of May, 1959, at the Empire State Building, a press conference announced the creation of the upcoming Freedom Land USA, the world's largest entertainment center. The location was a 205-acre site in the northeast area of the Bronx, which, to put that into perspective, Disneyland on opening day was only 160 acres. This site wasn't specifically chosen due to historical or cultural reasons, but mostly because undeveloped land around New York City at the time was already sparse and prohibitively expensive. Groundbreaking for the project took place on the 26th of August, 1959, and over 2,000 workers completed the park in just 300 days. The original construction estimate of $16 million would balloon out to a total cost of $65 million by the time the park had finally opened. This cost alone was newsworthy at the time, with the New York Times marveling that 22 movie spectaculars could be produced for the same investment as Freedom Land. Or to put it another way, you could have built four Disneylands, which cost just $17 million to build when it opened in 1955. The opening day for the park was set for the 1st of June, 1960. Though some delays in construction would see that pushed back to the 1st of July, before mistakenly being brought forward again to June the 19th, 1964, Father's Day Sunday, even though significant portions of the park were still unfinished, such as the drinking fountains, a large number of bathrooms, and many exhibits weren't even painted yet. On its opening day, the park was jam-packed with around 63,000 guests who had heard about the park through an aggressive marketing campaign featured on popular radio stations of the time. For the opening season of the park, all-day admission cost just $1 for adults, 75 cents for teenagers, and 50 cents for children, though that did not include the cost of rides, which were an upcharge. Ticket books that included admission as well as access to nine attractions of your choice 
with just $3.50 for an adult. Freedom Land was dubbed as the Disneyland of the East, but it aimed to be so much more than that. It wanted to blend family-friendly entertainment with education. It wasn't just a conventional amusement park, but a true theme park where you could experience the story of America through attractions that featured the Wild West, New Orleans, and even the future. You can probably see why it was called the Disneyland of the East. Upon its opening, Freedom Land contained 41 attractions, 13 kilometers of navigable waterways, and over 2,000 performers, all split across seven themed lands, or historical periods as they were called, with the entire park being loosely in the shape of the contiguous United States of America. The first land you would encounter after entering the park was little old New York, set in the time period between 1850 and 1900. This area served as the Main Street USA style entrance of the park and featured horse-drawn vehicles, Totsi and Perth, the New Harbor tugboats, all of the expected shops and restaurants, including a brewery, an apothecary, and even a recreation of the very first Macy's store. The land was also filled with entertainment, including music from a German umpa band, as well as the occasional surprise gangster holdup at the bank, one of the only actual bank branches ever located in a theme park. Taking either the New York Harbor tugboats or the horse-drawn trolley cars would have taken you to the next land of the park, Chicago of 1871. Old Chicago was centered around a massive waterway, which contained Chippewa Indian war canoes and two paddle wheelers, which toured guests around wooded islands, waterfalls, and even an Indian village. The most popular attraction in the area, though, was the Great Chicago Fire. Where on command every 20 minutes throughout the day, a large building would burst into flames. The Freedom Land Fire Company would then rush in with its 19th century water pump and enlist young park visitors to help them pump water to douse the flames. That's right, one of the most popular attractions in the park was based on a disaster that killed 300 people, destroyed 17 and a half thousand buildings, and left over 100,000 people homeless. Once you were finished in Chicago, you could jump aboard one of the authentic steam engines of the Santa Fe Railroad, which would take you to your next location in the park. San Francisco. Just be aware of any bandits though, as they were known to frequently hold up the train, searching through the passenger cars. The San Francisco area, set in 1906, was home to recreations of San Fran's Barbary Coast Entertainment and Chinatown Districts, a seal pool, and another of the park's major dark rides, the San Francisco Earthquake, where you would drive a vehicle right through the middle of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Buildings would shake all around you and even a two-story house would slide off its foundations towards the rider's vehicle. Once again, facing a ride off a disaster that this time killed over 3,000 people. The next two lands could be seen to fill the frontier land section of the park. First was the Great Plains, centered around Fort Cavalry, a replica of a US Army stockade where shootouts between bandits and the sheriff would occur. And if you were lucky, the morbidity of the park's attractions would be further presented with a live hanging of an inmate from the fort's jail. In the Great Plains, you could also ride aboard a stagecoach or learn about the Pony Express mail delivery service by sending a letter with a horseback rider, which could then be picked up later in the day in the next land of the park, the Old Southwest. Attractions in the Old Southwest of 1890 included a burrow trail ride, a dark ride through underground mine caverns featuring lava pits and cave creatures, live performance venues including a saloon, as well as the park's most popular walkthrough experience, the Casa Loca, or the Crooked House. A classic trick house where the laws of gravity seem to be challenged. The Old Southwest was also home to the Sky Ride, where guests could soar over the park in gondolas, which replicated mining company ore buckets. The second to last land was New Orleans, which was perpetually celebrating Mardi Gras, and was one of the most attraction-filled sections of the park. 
the area contained a dark ride simulation of a tornado, the world's first glass-walled mirror maze, and even a ride aboard a giant dragon. Two other major dark rides were also contained in the area, including the Civil War, a horse-drawn ride where guests would see the front lines of a Civil War battle, utilizing very early forms of audio animatronics. However, the most familiar sounding ride in the New Orleans area to us all is probably Buccaneers, a pirate dark ride which closely resembled that of Pirates of the Caribbean, yet debuted quite a few years before Disneyland's. Who knows if CV Wood got word of future expansions to the park and beat Disney to them. The final section of the park was Satellite City, focusing on the future, or should we say the tomorrow. Attractions within included an authentic reproduction of a Cape Canaveral control room where guests could view a simulated rocket launch, the Satellite City Turnpike, an Autopia-style drive-yourself ride, the Space Rover, a simulated rocket journey where you would zoom through the sky, and arguably the most exciting attraction in the entire park, the Moving Lake Walk, a travelator that took you across a small man-made lake. And finally, your night in the park would always end with a bang, concluding with a nightly fireworks show right before park close. In its first year of operation, Freedomland USA was visited by close to 2 million people, which is extra impressive when you realize the park's season only ran from May till September, due to the harsh New York winters. But despite these high attendance numbers and fanfare, Freedom Land began to fail soon after it had opened, and whilst management would try to blame it on almost every possible excuse, the rise and fall of the park was predetermined, and management insisted on the failure as part of their overall plan for the land. By the end of the park's second season, Freedom Land was already $8 million in debt, and in a quick fix attempt to boost attendance and profits, management would add unthemed thrill rides, skill games and midway attractions into the park, as well as the Moon Bowl, a performance venue that would feature top musical talents of the time. Freedom Land would see its last operating season in 1964, however it was already clear at the time that the end was near. Parts of the park were inaccessible, and souvenirs were being liquidated for a quarter. On September 15, 1964, Freedom Land USA would file for bankruptcy, amongst other things, blaming the 1964 World's Fair poaching their visitors as one of the official reasons for the closure. Of course, it would come out later that this closure was management's plan all along. Plans for the construction of a housing development project on the location began five years before the park was envisioned. Blueprints for 30 apartment buildings on the northeast Bronx marshland were drawn up, set to house 60,000 residents, and part of that plan included Freedom Land. The park was only allowed to operate on the land for a period of five years. The construction of the park would see a number of two-story buildings built on the marshland to house attractions, shops and restaurants. And if these buildings were able to remain intact without incurring any damage or sinking issues in the swampy marshland, the developers were able to avoid the need for a 15 to 20 year study on the suitability of the land for high rise housing. Freedom Land USA was not built to last. The park was merely designed as a proof of concept for a large housing development. Whilst it isn't unheard of to hear of theme parks being demolished for homes, spending all that money designing, constructing and running such an impressive theme park just to tear it down to build apartments five years later is such a loss to the industry. And worst of all, most of the creatives involved in the project including CV Wood were not aware that this park they were sinking all of their love and expertise into was predetermined to fail. The site of Freedom Land USA in the Bronx, New York, would ultimately become home to Co-op City, the largest housing cooperative in the world. After the park's closure, a number of rides and attractions would find a second home at other parks, including Tugboat Totsie, who moved to the Quasay Amusement Park in Middlebury, Connecticut, 
as well as both the San Francisco earthquake and New Orleans Buccaneer Dark Rides being moved to Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio, where the Pirates Dark Ride would be lovingly renamed Pirate Ride. Since the closure of this park, the closest project we've ever gotten to emulating this mix of theme park and historical teaching grounds was a plan for Disney's America, a historical theme park set to be built in Haymarket, Virginia in the early 1990s, before ultimately being cancelled in 1994. This idea of mixing history with entertainment has always required treading a fine line. You want to be seen as truthful without coming across as boring. And whilst a lot of Freedom Land USA's attractions seem to border on the macabre, it truly did seem like a place where you could learn at least a little about history whilst having a great day out with your family. It's just a shame that such a fun, groundbreaking place was purely designed as a front for real estate development. From the home of all things theme parks, I'm Luke for review time. Thanks for watching, liking, and subscribing.